And so what that means, every time I preach, it's going to be something from the book of Philippians until I finish. Uh, and we're going to start just in chapter 1. Um, but it will be something from Philippians uh, until we get through the rest of the book. And that song that, that we sang, Rejoice in the Lord, it really uh, resonates with the, really just the, the, the whole idea, the central idea of the book of Philippians, really, uh, especially chapter 1. But uh, Paul starts his, his whole argument with finding reasons to rejoice even though uh, he's in prison. Finding reasons to rejoice even though there's people out there that are trying to preach uh, they're preaching the gospel of Christ, but they're doing it out of a spirit of contentment, they're doing, or discontentment. They're doing it out of a, a desire to hurt Paul's ministry rather than try to help him. And yet Paul's looking at all of that, and even though these people are actively trying to uh, destroy all the churches that Paul has set up, that Paul has planted, Paul looks at that and he says that Christ is preached, and in that I'm going to rejoice. And then at the end of the book, in chapter 4, G or Paul says... Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. So everything, really the whole central message of this, is that there's always a reason to rejoice in the Lord. And I don't know if you know the backstory to Rejoice in the Lord, but that's really the song that God used to help uh, start Ron Hamilton's Patch the Pirate ministry. Uh, he was a Bob Jones graduate, and you know, he was serving, already serving the Lord in, in church ministry, uh, and really just had a desire to do something more. And in God's good providence, uh, you know, Ron Hamilton was diagnosed with ocular cancer. And that was a, a very a trying time for them. But, you know, they had to go, and he had to get his eye removed, and he got a patch. And he went to church, and he said, the, the kids at my church started calling me Patch, Patch the Pirate. And that's how that ministry got started. And his, one of his first songs was Rejoice in the Lord, because even in the midst of something that is really a trial, that is difficult, God can use it. And God used it in so many ways. And I'll tell you, I don't know if I would be here without the ministry of Patch the Pirate on my life. I, I never met him, but his songs really helped shape and mold me. And I'm glad that you know, I can be here today. So we're going to be in the book of Philippians. I'm, I'm going to focus on verses, uh, Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to focus on verses 12, basically through the rest of the chapter, um, and basically uh, we'll just kind of build the argument. Uh, in the first couple verses, you have the, the standard greeting, uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are, at, who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's basically, that's the standard, this is who's writing, this is who I'm writing to, and then he starts with, grace and peace be to you. And really, you know, he's, he kicks off this letter with thanksgiving. You know, he, he addresses the Philippians, and then he goes right into, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Because if you know anything about the Philippian church, they were really the ones that stuck with Paul throughout the course of, the, mo the majority of his missionary journeys. Like, even though there, there were a church made up of very poor people in the town of Philippi, they took it upon themselves to take many offerings for him. And, you know, Paul is bringing that to remembrance. Uh, you know, always offering prayer with joy, verse 4, in every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he goes into verse 6, For I am confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. So he's already thanking God for their service, and then he's encouraging them. You know, even in the midst of some things that, are, that were going on in the Philippian church at that time, God was using it. And Paul says here that if you stay faithful to Christ, God is going to use that, and God is going to perfect that work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. And then we come to, uh, well, let's pick up in verse 12. And we're, we're talking about, uh, just to give you a little, bit, a little bit of context of what's going on here. Paul's in prison. Um, and there's, there's some argumentation as to where he's in prison. I think the one that fits best is that he's imprisoned in Rome under house arrest. And so 
he's got guards that are with him all the time, and he's in chains, and you know he, he's in prison. He doesn't have a lot of freedom. But even in that, he's, he's, he's awaiting trial as well. And in, in all of that, he still find reasons, finds reasons to rejoice. You know, here's a guy, if you know anything about waiting trial in prison, you don't know if you're going to get sentenced to life in prison. You don't know if you're going to get sentenced to uh, whatever kind of form of punishment. I mean, you might know what's at stake, but you don't know if you're going to get sentenced to life or uh, punishment by death. And Paul is waiting in a Roman prison. And he's, you know, he doesn't want to be in prison, of course. That's a very difficult situation. But he's starting to realize things that are happening as a result of him being in prison and in which he can find reasons to rejoice. So let's start reading in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. That's really the first point I want to look at is we're just going to lay out Paul's circumstances. Circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Verse 13. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And verse 14, And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So, first we see that uh, we're looking at the furtherance of the gospel. That's the first circumstance that we see under Paul's imprisonment. He starts talking right away, talking about the furtherance of the gospel. He could have picked anything in the world to to start complaining about. God, why am I in prison? You know, why is, why is this happening? Why can't I be out there ministering? But no, the first thing he says is the gospel is going forth. Amen. And in that, I will rejoice. Paul's situation was well known throughout the Praetorian Guard. The, the Roman legion that was stationed there, they all knew that not only was he a Christian, but they knew that he had a ministry, that he had a testimony and if it weren't for him being in prison, he would not, have, would not have had a ministry to those soldiers. So Paul's already seeing this. Like, I would not be here, I would not be ministering to these, these human beings if I was not in this predicament. So the first thing is that the gospel is going forth. And because he's in prison, he's got a ministry to the Roman guards. And secondly, as a result of Paul's imprisonment, fellow Christians were emboldened to speak the truth without fear. At the most of the brethren, that's the Philippian brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. They're looking at Paul going, if that guy is in prison and he can preach and he's not afraid of what the Romans can do to him, then so can we who are not in prison. You know, these are the, the elders really, or the, the believers of the Philippian church are reading this letter from Paul and basically they're saying, if he can preach in prison and have confidence and rejoice in the Lord, then we can be emboldened to do the same thing. And Paul noticed that too. And he uses that as a second reason to rejoice in the circumstances that he was in. So his circumstances is that he's in prison, more than likely in Rome, awaiting trial. Doesn't know if he's going to be sentenced to life or death in prison. Yet he's finding these reasons to rejoice. And the first is that he's got a ministry to the Praetorian Guard. Second is that the other believers are seeing this and that they're being more emboldened to preach Christ through faith. And then that brings me to letter B. The first of Paul's circumstances is that the gospel is going forth, the furtherance of the gospel. Second of the circumstances that I see here is blessing mixed with trial. So the, the believers in uh, verse 14 are seeing this, they're, they're boldly preaching. And then we come to verse 15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Verse 16. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Verse 17. The former proclaim Christ out of self-ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So, in all these reasons to rejoice, there's still this, uh, this envy, this discontentment, this trial being mixed with blessing. And to give you some context, there was a group of 
of Jewish believers known as Judaizers. And my understanding is that the Judaizers did not really, they did not like Paul because Paul taught that the Gentiles could be saved through faith alone and that they were not required because they were Gentiles, they were not required to abide by the Jewish customs. Uh, the Judaizers said, well, no, salvation happens through faith alone, but on top of that, you need to be sort of as, as a Jewish male, and then you need to follow the Jewish customs. Essentially, the Judaizers said, you can be saved, but you need to live like a good Jew. And they didn't like Paul because Paul said, no, 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 no. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. So a Gentile doesn't have to abide by the Jewish customs. So I, I think, I don't have backing for this, but I think the closest group today that we might consider kind of like the Judaizers are what we call Messianic Jews. They are believers, but they ascribe to uh, living some of the old customs of the Jewish tradition. And they, they also go to church on Saturdays. Um, but in this context, the, the group that was known as the Judaizers was actually actively trying to destroy the work that Paul was doing in Philippi. Because they were going to Paul's converts and they were saying, hey, that, that Paul guy is leading you. You need to come over here. And they were causing division. And they did this not just in Philippi, but they did it in Corinth, they did it in Ephesus. Almost every church that Paul really ministered in, Paul had a, a, a hand in planting, there was a sect of Judaizers there who were trying to lead people astray. And so this is the context that, that is happening. Paul's first in prison, but he's also getting some distressing reports from the church at Philippi that they have these false teachings that are going on. And so that's who, that's who I think he's referring to. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. I think he's referring to the Judaizers because even though they're preaching the gospel, they weren't doing it for the purpose of reaching the lost. They were doing it for the purpose of uh, really just dividing the, the, the churches that Paul had started. They, they were doing it to get back at Paul. You know, they weren't, they weren't doing it to spread the gospel. So that, and that causes distress, like... Some churches were splitting over this, and it was becoming a threat, a growing threat, especially among new believers who didn't have a whole lot of theological backing yet, you know, and it, it caused people to go astray. So this was, this was a problem. Uh, so the Judaizers were preaching Christ out of envy. Then, verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So there were, there were two groups of people that were preaching Christ. One was the sect of Judaizers, and the other was a group of people that were actually having a, expressing a sincere desire to preach the Word of God. And they were doing it out of love for Christ and out of loyalty to Paul because they understood that Paul was appointed by God for the defense of the gospel. And this is, this is the circumstance that Paul is in. And the, really the Philippian church is in distressing circumstances as well. So then we come to verse 18, where Paul says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. This is yet another reason that Paul finds to rejoice in the Lord, even in the midst of the things that were going on. The gospel is going forth, and whatever the reason being behind those who are preaching it, whether it's out of envy or whether it's out of love, the same gospel message is still going forth. And Paul says, in this, a guy who could be on death row, a guy who's waiting trial, a guy who's got people that don't really hate him and are trying to hurt his ministry, he could have looked at all those things, but no, he said, I'm going to rejoice because the gospel is going forth and Jesus is being glorified. And that's Paul's circumstances. And the second point that I want to come to starts really in verse 18. Uh, the, the first point we looked at was Paul's circumstances, and then we're going to come to Paul's response to his circumstances, which starts in verse 18. And here again, we see this theme of finding a reason to rejoice. I already read verse 18, so I'm going to go to verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So either way, Christ is preached, 
and I'm going to glory in that. Whether by the Judaizers for the purpose of strife, or by those who preach sincerely, the gospel is still going forth. Secondly, under uh, letter B, Paul sees a deliverance, whether physical or eternal, is coming. That's the deliverance that he talks about in verse 19. I know that this will work for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the Spirit. I was reading a uh, commentary on this, and uh, they said that it seems Paul left some amb ambiguity on purpose because he's expressing a desire to be delivered from the Roman prison. But we're going to see in the next couple verses that his desire to glorify Christ, whether by life or by death, actually is greater than his desire to be released from prison. So when he talks about a deliverance here, it seems to me that he's saying, I would like to be delivered from the Roman prison, but if, my, that's, that's, not, if that's not to happen, I still have a deliverance that's ultimately going to be in Christ. And the, uh, the, the Philippian church was praying for him. They were supporting him. And he says, I know that this, these circumstances will turn out for my deliverance, whether physical or eternal, because of your prayer, through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So either way, he's, he's able to genuinely say, I can rejoice in the Lord because I'm going to be delivered. If it's not on this earth, then I'm going to be delivered in heaven where I'm going to spend eternity with Christ. Again, yet another reason to rejoice. But he also expresses a clear desire and expectation to depart from the world and be with Christ. We're going to find uh, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So again, he's still saying it would be nice to be released from prison, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But I can have confidence that I'm not going to be put to shame in Christ, because whether by life or by death, Christ is glorified. And I'm, I'm going to rejoice in that. Beyond these desires... Paul recognizes that being allowed to love would being allowed to live would grant him opportunities to continue serving Christ through spreading the gospel and strengthening strengthening the church at Philippi, which would be more necessary for the sake of fellow Christians. Let's pick up reading in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So Paul says, Look, if I live, if, if I survive this Roman I don't have more time here on this earth, I'm okay with that, because that's going to give me an opportunity to serve Christ more. And if I, verse 22, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. I am hard pressed from both the directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. What Christian doesn't want to desire to be with Christ? And that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to desire, for that is very much better. Yet to remain, verse 24, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So Paul's rejoicing in the fact that he's going to be delivered. He would love to uh, really just depart this world and be with Christ. But he's totally, 100% sold out to being allowed to live further in this troubled world so that he could really have a, a greater ministry, that he could really help out the Philippians more. He says, for me to stay here is better for you. Better for me that I die and I be with Christ. But if I'm allowed to live, it's better for you. And in that, I will rejoice. So it, really, in, in every part of his argument, Paul keeps coming back to this, there's always a reason to rejoice. No matter what I'm going through or what's happening in my surrounding circumstances, none of those circumstances will ever transcend or outdo a reason to rejoice in the Lord. I can always find that hope. And then the last point that I want to look at is Paul's encouragement to the Philippians. So we've already looked at his circumstances. We've already looked at his response to his circumstances. And the last thing that I want to look at is Paul's encouragement to the Philippians. Verse, uh, we'll start verse, reading in verse 25. Uh, actually, back up to verse 23. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. 
So I'd love to be with Christ, but to, to remain here is more necessary for the ministry. Verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. I think what he's saying here is that convinced of what my desires are in this situation, whether I, whether I live or die or, or, or what, whatever happens, I'm going to trust God with that. And I can set that aside. And for the time at hand, I will remain with you so that I can encourage you and help you become better, more mature believers. Verse 26, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you. Keep in mind in Philippi, it was a Roman province, province and in culture, in, in the Philippian culture, it was, a, it was kind of like a, a big deal to have Roman citizenship. It was, you know, that was a calling card. Hey, you're a citizen of Rome because you live in Philippi. And Paul says, I want you guys to remember that you're citizens of Christ. You're, you're citizens of the kingdom of Christ. So I want to remain here to help you become more mature believers in Christ, not so that you look at me and say, hey, look at that, that Roman guy. He's a, he's a really good uh, Christian. No, so that you can look at me and see the example of Christ and become more mature citizens of the future kingdom of Christ. And he's reminding them, yeah, it's great that you're Roman citizens. That's, that's a good thing in this culture. But you're not going to be here forever. You're going to live with Christ if you're, if, if you're a believer. And you need to remember that you're a citizen of, of God's kingdom. And that will bring us to verse 27. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So he's really, he has, he's expressing a, a desire to help the Philippians progress in their faith. And, and he's finding reasons to rejoice in this. Uh, convinced uh, that his desires can be set aside, he's wanting to help the believers and he's not really focusing on his own plight. You know, he could still be focusing on the fact that he's in prison, that he's the one suffering, but he's not. He's focusing on helping the, the Philippian church. And uh, then he says that helping them out and encouraging, he says that there's going to be uh, more adversity. Things are going to happen uh, that were already happening, but that's, that's just going to keep happening. That, that division uh, by the Judaizers and by others who were enemies of all enemies of Christ were going to keep sowing discord. And that was going to cause some problems. So Paul says here that you need to be courageous. Conduct yourselves, verse 27, as a, as a citizen that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that when I hear of you, I can hear that you are standing firm in the gospel that you are standing with one mind, with one spirit, and the gospel is still going forth and still being proclaimed. And then he says in verse 28, in no way alarmed by your opponents. This is a sign of courage. He wants the Philippians uh, to get to such with Christ that it doesn't matter how many opponents they have. It doesn't matter how much persecution they face. They're not going to be afraid of it. And they're going to be able to develop that courage that is needed. And then Paul says, your enemies are going to see that courage. And it's going to melt away. It's going to be to them a sign of destruction. But to you, a sign of redemption. A sign of salvation. That comes from God. And I think that's what he's saying. So these are the encouragement that the encouragement Paul is giving. And then we come to verse 29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Paul starts speaking of suffering in the context of persecution like it's a gift from God. It's granted unto you, not only to believe on salvation, but to suffer for the cause of Christ. Because the thing is, doesn't matter how much 
suffering or difficult times or trials or persecution that we've been through, no one has ever been through anything as difficult as Christ himself. And then, uh, if, you, if you look at Matthew chapter 5, Paul kind of mirrors Matthew's argument. I'm going to turn there real quick. Actually, he mirrors, mirrors Christ's argument because it's uh, part of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is how suffering for the cause of Christ should really be considered to the believer as a gift. It is an honor to suffer for Christ and with Christ because we have an eternal home in heaven. And Jesus has already delivered us from everything that happens in this world. He's already declared power and victory over it. And everything that we face is going to be temporary. Every pain, every trial, everything that can be considered as suffering today is going to pass away. So we can consider it an honor to suffer for Christ now because it's only temporary. Our reward is eternal. There's going to be no tears. There's going to be no pain, no trials. And we can use, like, all of that is going to be done away with. So, for now, remember that you're doing it for the cause of Christ. You're doing it for the cause of the gospel. And that's what Paul is saying to the, to the Philippians. You know, you're, you're going to have trials. You're going to have enemies that are going to come after you. But consider it a blessing. Consider it a gift that you are not worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ because really that's, that's a sign that you belong to Him. Yeah. You know, Satan's not going to attack you very much if you don't belong to Christ. He doesn't have any reason to. But if you belong to Christ and you're serving Him, Satan's got to beef with you because you're doing things that are going to advance the gospel. Satan hates that. So you can take heart in a way, you can take heart in any time that you, get, that, that you get attacked or that you have a trial or, or a difficulty because in a very real sense, it is an assurance that you belong to Christ. And these, these are the things that Paul is encouraging these believers with. So in conclusion, I'd really like to highlight really just two things that I see Paul bringing up constantly in in whole passage. And the first of that is that there's always a reason to rejoice. In everything that we face, everything that we go through, there's nothing too small for God. He can use everything to the praise and glory of God. I gave the example earlier of Patch the Pirate. I mean, to them, having cancer, having ocular cancer, it looked like there was no way out. Yeah, but that was Extremely difficult, trying time, but God had a purpose. And if that had not happened, how many people would not be able to today? How many people has God used them to reach with the, with the cause of Christ? Paul's situation was similar. He's in prison, but if he wasn't in prison, he wouldn't be able to preach to the guards. He wouldn't be emboldening, or emboldening the other Philippian believers. He would not have his great ministry yet he had as a result of being in prison. You know, sometimes we think that we're the only ones going through whatever it is that we're going through. And the fact is, Satan loves to make you feel alone. But you're not. Christ has already suffered something that no other person could ever do. He's the one that knows the pain. And if he's calling you to go through something, he's using it kind of like a finding pot. He's he calls you to go through that. He leads you through that. And he never promises that it's going to be easy, but he does promise to lead you through it and walk with you through it. And then when you come out on the other end, you're purified as gold. And you're more moldable and you're more Christ-like. And in that, you can have reason to rejoice. Everything that you go, to, go through, Christ is going to use it for his honor and glory and to make you a better Christian.
stronger Christian. So there's always a reason to rejoice. And then the second thing that I'd just like to highlight is that when we do find ourselves suffering for the cause of Christ, it's a blessing. Because the gospel is going forth, and if we can be counted worthy by the King of Kings to suffer for his sake, it means that he looks at that and counts us worthy to spend eternity with him. And that's a blessing. So 